This, there's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. You like me right now. You like me. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted this. Mom, I just want an Oscar. I'm Connor Wold and welcome back to another episode of The Ultimate Oscar Showdown. And this week we are continuing our look at the best lead actress category, looking at the Oscar winners from this decade. In this video, we'll be looking at the 90s and tier ranking them from S tier all the way to D tier. You guys have been showing a lot of support for the series so far, so please continue to do that. That means commenting below. Let me know your own personal rankings, liking the video, subscribing to the channel. All that stuff really helps. And we're gonna continue on next week and the week after that, looking at the 80s and then the 70s lead actresses and, and ranking them from the winners from those decades and then eventually going back to the best supporting actor category in the 2010s and working our way through and then the best supporting actors category but that's for the future for this episode we're going to be ranking all the winners from the 1990s in the best actress category and starting off we're going to be looking at the 1990 winner kathy bates for misery the iconic performance as annie wilkes the self-obsessed stalking fan she is a complete, pretty much unknown, coming into the movie, doing some side parts. But compared to an actor like James Caan, she's definitely an unknown. And the fact that she's in this two-hander with him. This is Rob Reiner coming off of When Harry Met Sally and Stand By Me. And uh, this is Spinal Tap. So a lot of juice he's got behind him. This is truly a star-making performance. I mean, we forget sometimes just how much of a breakthrough it is. And I think, you know, people mischaracterize this performance as just crazy and I think crazy is kind of easy to do uh, on screen I mean it's it's easy to just be over the top and act irrational and smile a lot and be creepy it's easy kind of to be crazy because there's sort of a playbook for that what's difficult is to be the sort of borderline crazy is to communicate to the audience that oh this lady's bonkos but have the character not totally realize that that they are showing it and then sort of that borderline scenes, which, you know, a good chunk of the first half of the movie really is. It's, it's Annie Wilkes trying to show that she's not crazy, that she is just trying to help out James Caan before she eventually goes crazy, you know, full out on, on the later part of the film. But she toes that line really well in terms of communicating to us. The character doesn't realize how insane this is. She doesn't realize it. She doesn't have that emotional capacity but is still trying to, is still communicating that this person is seriously mentally ill and, you know, a danger to the story. So for me, because of her ability to do that, and then also the great, you know, iconic craziness with the, the mallet and whatnot later on in the film, uh, the fact she's able to do both, not just act crazy, but show us that progression is what makes this, for me, an iconic performance that will go into the A tier. Then the 1991 winner, Jodie Foster for The Silence of the Lambs. Uh, we talked about this movie already, so we won't go too in depth on, on this one because we talked about this in the Best Picture Winners uh, ranking video for the 90s. But this is a movie I've seen a bunch of times. And for me, I think the first time you watch it, you're impressed by Hannibal Lecter. And then the second time you watch it, you're impressed by Buffalo Bill. All right, there's another villain and he's really great in it. And then the third time around, I think you're impressed by Jonathan Demme. And the fact that like, wow, this is a really tight story. It moves quickly, good tension, well-directed. Good job, Jonathan Demme. And then the fourth time, I think you realize, oh wait, Jodie Foster's incredibly terrific in this too. Because Ironically, that's also the, the point of the story, is that she is this woman in the police force who is constantly overlooked, and that's the strength of Foster in performance, is in her ability to always seem like she's holding back her tongue. She communicates to the audience and tells us through her acting that she is annoyed, and she doesn't always like this, the fact that whether it be her diminutive size or her sort of lack of respect that she gets from some of her male counterparts and colleagues, she's always clearly impacted by it and she can give that with just a look or, or a sigh never directly though always sort of holding back her tongue so it sort of emphasizes those themes very well through her acting i think is a testament when you rewatch it so many times she really stands out as of course being one of the core representatives of, of the theme of the movie and because this movie is not a brute force physical movie it's all about intelligence and about unraveling the mystery foster is perfect at that i mean she's one of the most 
incredible actors, maybe the best actor at portraying intelligence and capability. Uh, she always seems smart. She's always great at thinking. You know, certain actors are really great at thinking on screen. You can understand that they're processing things and you can see the moment on her face when she puts it all together, right? And does so completely without dialogue, completely without saying things or doing an overwrought monologue. It's just with the way she sort of puts things together, then raises her eyebrows, and then boom, she's got it, and she's on to the next thing, and you understand that uh, as an audience member. So for a movie that's reliant on her, showing off her intelligence, showing off her capability and her ability to think, combined with her use of her sort of smaller size and, and just looks of annoyance, I think Foster is really incredible in this movie. So another A-tier performance. Then Emma Thompson in Howard's End, the 1992 winner. This is a movie we, I've already actually covered on this channel. I covered it for a Forgotten Oscar Films episode. So if you want to hear my full thoughts really on, on that movie, you can, you can check that out on this channel. But just briefly here in terms of Thompson and her performance, I do think she's the best performance within the film, just because I think she's the queen of the reaction shot. That in any movie, if you just cut to a reaction shot of Emma Thompson, she can tell us so much about the characters in her lives and the story and what that means. And Howard Zinn is really great at utilizing that, in which a scene will quote-unquote end, but then we'll have a beat or an or two beats and just a couple seconds to cut back to the reaction shot to see how Emma Thompson's character is processing that or after she says something how is she thinking about what she just said which gives uh, I think Thompson a lot to work with on that end the movie isn't a slam dunk for me but all the stuff that does work is Thompson's performance and her ability to show that repression that somewhat visible anger that lack of hopelessness I think can all be communicated, all those themes within our character can be communicated just simply by a reaction shot, even though the movie doesn't always give her the most chance to sometimes explain her feelings because it just gives her reaction shots and Thompson does a lot with those reaction shots, but sometimes you want her to get a bit more written scenes and allow her to explain herself. You know, I also think because it's only a two and a half hour movie, it really feels like it should be a mini series. Uh, so we miss out on some of those character motivations and scenes that maybe exist in the book, but don't within the film, so there's a struggle there. Uh, but the performance is, is, is solid for sure, um, and we'll go in the B tier. Then the 1993 winner, Holly Hunter for The Piano. Uh, one of the most fascinating casting choices of all time to take uh, a woman who is known for being um, someone with so much energy, kind of a firecracker type performer, and to make her silent and reserved and repressed. And also to make someone who has such an iconic voice in Holly Hunter and to make her mute with only a few instances where she gets to, to speak. A fascinating choice of taking away those superpowers that Holly Hunter brings. Does it work? For some people, it does, yeah. But for me, I had real struggles ultimately connecting with the emotions of the character the same way the characters in the movie do. I feel like there's an understanding within the filmmaker and all the other characters within the movie that they understand her. But as a performance style, I was never totally able to connect with her. I think because you have that huge barrier of being mute, that's really difficult. And Hunter does do stuff to make you understand her, her point of view. And I don't know if any other actor would have been able to do more necessarily. But it's a challenging performance and I think a challenging watch because of that. I just had really tr uh, big trouble trying to access her emotions and her thoughts, which left me ultimately cold to her character. And I thought that Hunter didn't do enough as a performer to help me access that. Now, I don't know if anyone really could have just because of the restrictions of the performance, but that being said, it just it limited its emotional appeal for me. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to put this one in the C tier. Then the 1994 winner, Jessica Lang for Blue Sky. And this is another performance that I didn't totally emotionally connect with, unfortunately, either. And Jessica Lange is an actress that I think is the sort of William Hurt uh, female equivalent. In that William Hurt has a bunch of movies that he was nominated for in the 80s and 90s, winning for. But a lot of them are forgotten. Kiss of the Spider Woman, Children of a Lesser God, The Accidental Tourist. They're not kind of iconic movies in the same way if you look at Robert De Niro's Oscar nominations, Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, you know, they're much more notable and iconic. And similarly with Jessica Lange, I was looking at her nominations and movies like this, Francis, Country, Sweet Dreams, Music Box, and this movie, Blue Sky, I hadn't even heard of any of them. Uh, they're totally forgotten. They're not in the conversation at all. The only reason Blue Skies maybe in the conversation a bit is because Jessica Lange won the Oscar for this film. 
Now, is this maybe a, a secret masterpiece that's been lost? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Unfortunately, I think. You know, she does well in certain instances playing the sexies, coded bipolar housewife where she can be manic and kind of seductive and alluring, but also, you know, mentally unstable at times. But also, I think she can be woefully melodramatic and over the top, which doesn't totally align with the reality and the sort of groundedness of which the movie is filmed with. It's a tough character play because it's never totally e even keeled. But, and, and Lang doesn't totally whiff on it. She does have some scenes where he works very well, but it's just too inconsistent for me to ultimately celebrate it. So for me, it goes into the C tier. Susan Sarandon for Dead Man Walking is the 1995 winner. And I did a whole video on Susan Sarandon just last year for my Movie Star Magic series, in which I talked about all of her career. And yet I didn't talk about this performance. So I'm gonna really go deep into this one because Sarandon is a really terrific actress. I think she's an, she's an underrated actress. And she could be l l lumped into maybe like a Jessica Lange, in which she was always dominated, particularly within the 90s. And, you know, not all of her movies are the most canonized uh, similarly to Jessica Lange although I do think at least in her Oscar win it's a better performance I do think this is really terrific what well, could have been a story about a sweet nun becomes an intense morality picture about what it means to be Christian and to have empathy about a, a Christian nun who develops a spiritual relationship with a, a man on death row and you know offers up a lot of questions of the righteousness of you know death by state but also what it means to connect with this person and how atrocious of the acts do you have to commit before god doesn't forgive you and should you even be given that opportunity to talk about that and all these themes are going on and they all work so well because of srandon and her, her her performance because so many of the scenes are just her and pen or her with her other nuns debating these sort of topics and Sarandon doesn't have the answer. I think that's what's so interesting about her performance is that she's entirely wrought throughout the film. She doesn't know if it's the right thing. She has all these different methods. On time, she really relies completely on scripture and the Bible and, and working through those thoughts that way. But other times, when she has just a one-on-one -on -one with Sean Penn, she's trying to connect on a human level, often sort of darting her eyes, looking and searching for, her, for his soul and connect on that human level. But she's, she's unsure. She doesn't know the answer to these questions. She doesn't know what she should be doing, but she's been asked by this man, and she believes it's her Christian duty to do so. And, and so she does. And because Sarandon is unsure, she can therefore show off her range. Sometimes, you know, strong in her convictions, sometimes dumbfounded in her inability to, to, to do anything. Um, going from defiant to innocent to charming, she can sort of do it all in, in the film and does do it all. So I think this is a deeply studied character portrait about a testing of faith and what empathy really means to have for, for, for someone else, regardless of situation. So it's a movie that asks these sort of ethical and moral questions, but those ethical and moral questions, as a viewer, you're struggling with, but you're also struggling with it on an even greater sense because you see the character and see Sarandon as a performer struggle with that as well. So the incredible range that she has, the deeply studied character approach that's on uh, on the screen, she is the reason why the movie succeeds. So for me, it's therefore an S-tier uh, performance. Then the 1996 winner, Frances McDormand for Fargo. And Fargo is one of my all-time favorite movies. And I think this is one of my all-time favorite performances because it's it's a so such a well-written character, but McDormand, bring so much more towards it as well, in that this is probably the closest thing I've seen, with certain exceptions of film, to a real life person. You know, it's not a transformative performance. I think for a lot of people to understand acting, it has to be transformative. It has to be, oh, this person doesn't look like they do normally because they put on all this prosthetics, therefore it's good, therefore they are able to transform to someone different. But this person doesn't exist, and yet McDormand brings this incredible sense of life to this person, to this police officer who's sort of the ideal representation of a police officer sort of putting on and enforcing the rules of the Western world. I think she totally understands the moral core of the center, center of the character, which is the sense of decency. She is this soon-to-be Midwestern mom trying to do the right thing, always with that core of decency. Now, that's not to say she's idealistic or an 
completely flawless person. It just means that she is coming from a good place, but still is able to react differently to different situations. She can be earnest at, at the very end or wholesome with scenes with, with, with her husband or kind of awkward and, and, and weirded out with a scene with her old high school friend or suspicious in scenes with William H. Macy. She, she does have that range to show off all those different instances. But in so many movies, the actors play characters who are just in service to the story, that they don't exist outside of the story. So oftentimes in these cop type movies, they're so obsessed with their job, they don't have any home life because it's a convenient storytelling technique because we can therefore focus on what audiences are here to, to see, which is the mystery, the story, the intrigue. So the cops are always on their job, they don't have a home life and, and, and it makes it interesting. But the genius of the movie is that this is a regular like a regular person, a police officer who that's her job, yes, but has other instances, has a home life, has past relationships. And that sense of life and that sense of reality that's brought to this character is through McDormand. It's the way her eyes glow when her husband walks through the, the, the room and she can sort of have this weight lifted off her shoulders even for, you know, 10 minutes. It's the sort of way she tightens up her shoulders when she's a little bit suspicious or, or leans forward or just sort of darts her eyebrows a little bit more. She's the one that's bringing life to the character. Yes, we have those scenes which give her, you know, that sense of, of home life, but it's her ability to modulate her personality throughout the different instances that make her feel like a real life character because she's not just one beat throughout the entire movie. She's different within different people, which is how ultimately real life people are. Um, so for me, it's the closest thing to an actor bringing someone to life <laughs> in a movie. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So for me, it's S tier stuff, um, without a doubt. Then the 1997 winner, Helen Hunt for As Good As It Gets, which is a movie I covered in the 90s Best Actor Winners ranking video because Jack Nicholson won for Best Actor. And while I talked about in that video my strugglings with the movie, the stuff that I do like about the movie is often to do with Helen Hunt. Uh, I think there is a sense of emotional honesty that she brings with her character. There's a reason I think why Jack Nicholson's character in the film falls in love with Helen Hunt's character because her sort of honest, I don't give a F humane kind of an attitude, lack of performance style is very charming, it's very endearing, it's unique in that way. But you also have to remember, right, Helen Hunt is an actress. She's acting as someone who can't act anymore because the, the actual character her, herself is not an actor. She's just, just a waitress. But I mean act in the sense of putting up a front. You know, she has a kid. She does her job. She doesn't really care about how other people necessarily view her. She's just trying to do her best. And she's kind of tired of, of putting up a front and putting on a face for others, the character within the movie. And that's easy to do when you're, say, a real life person. But you have to think about it, the extra complexity of Helen Hunt, who is an actress, playing somebody and knowing her, this character so well that they can at least seem like there's a true sense of authenticity with that character, if that makes any sense. But the other great parts of the movie are when we just get the close-ups of Helen Hunt, where the world sort of slows down and she can say more with just a reaction shot than any sort of witty James Brooke line of dialogue and is the only person that really sort of holds Jack Nicholson's sort of jerk mentalities and his sort of feet to the fire in that regard and, and confronts him in this really sort of direct and impactful way. So while I don't love the movie, I think Hunt really gets to, to shine and, and is totally terrific in the film. So for me, it's an, it's an A-tier performance. Then the 1998 winner, Gwyneth Paltrow for Shakespeare in Love. Another movie which I talked about, except on the 90s Best Picture winner's ranking video. And I mentioned that episode how I didn't totally love the movie. That being said, I think Gwyneth Paltrow, Paltrow is totally uh, terrific and solid in this film. I think she's totally well equipped to do what she's being asked to do, particularly in that sort of movie star charm element. I think she is incredible and you understand why she's such a powerful leading lady for so many years to come in this movie because you see how well she's able to weaponize her beauty. I mean, it's because this character is so passionate for love and for Shakespeare and for life. She has this innocence, but she's so interested in learning so much. We see sort of this really smart way of 
Paltrow weaponizing, I think, her beauty, just the fact of her sort of slumped shoulders, her tilted head. She has a sort of aura and glow to her that I think Paltrow leans into in terms of her performance style. And she's so good at that. Uh, she's so good at that that I actually think some of the other scenes, would it's less lovey-dovey and less emotional and more to do with sort of confrontation and, and seriousness. She struggles with because she's not as good with that. She's not as experienced of an actor. But that core charm of innocence, of purity, of demonstrating love, I think she captures so well uh, with those scenes that it almost makes sometimes her other scenes seem worse, even though they're just kind of fine. Uh, so for me, when she's good, she's great, uh, even if the other stuff falls a little bit flat. So for me, her performance will go into the B tier. And then finally, the 1999 winner, Hilary Swank for Boys Don't Cry. And she's an actress who we talked about her career in last week's video, so we're not going to touch upon that. But I think... When we see this performance, you really understand why so many of these directors were enamored by her and why she was so well celebrated in this, this five-year period. And now, I'm not an expert on what constitutes a good representational story telling of trans ideology today. But what I can say, just as a film lover and an analyzer of this film, is that I do think that there is a strong sense that these actors and these directors have a deep care for their characters, um, whether it be Kimberly Pierce and her sort of storytelling style, but, but really Swank, you know, you know, Pierce tells us that she cares for these characters, but I think Swank makes us feel for, for these characters. You know, this is not a story about unsureness or conflict. You know, Brandon knows he's a man. He's not worried about that necessarily. He's worried about how other people are going to perceive him once they figure that out. And Swank brings that anxiety. It's not an unsureness, it's an anxiety. It's an anxiety of the future. It's a worrying of what will happen when people figure out, it's a worry about some of those consequences that society is going to put onto Brandon that he doesn't want to happen. And Swank, as an actress, understands that and gives that sort of jitteriness to the performance. You know, when people ask Brandon about his past, you know, there's sort of a jitteriness. There is an unsure, not unsureness, but a... Um, anxiousness generally in terms of how he's always sort of moving back and forth and swaying and he can't sit still because he is hiding kind of the secret that he's not uncomfortable with himself but he's anxious and worried about how people will perceive him after they know the fact which brings i think a lot of the tension to the film so a strong physical uncomfortable type performance but still one that's able to bring a deep amount of empathy into th this man's story so i think it's a great performance that is key to the film so for me it's an a tier performance but that's about it take a look at the list i thought the 90s were a good decade so some some low stuff but still i mean francis mcdormand for fargo and, and even susan Strand for dead man walking i think those are some of the best performances of the 90 male female doesn't matter they're so uh, well realized so i'm glad i got to talk about them but that's about it i hope you enjoyed the video like i said at the top comment below let me know your thoughts and your personal rankings for the 90s actress winners uh, but that's about it i hope you enjoyed the video and also, until next time, stay tuned.